Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining again this week. Uh, we're gonna cover objection handling at, oh, sorry. <laughs> I have the wrong, yeah, objection handling and prevention. We're, uh, we're gonna kick off here talking specifically about uh, understanding the customer's perspective and really kind of starting to think about you know, what we need to do and to really, I guess, drive more awareness as we sell to kind of reduce as many of the objections as we go. So, you know, some of the most common objections that we face, price, uh, timing, competitor comparisons, all these things are always coming into play and we've got very, very consistent um, issues around overcoming these. And, you know, as we get better and better at having sales conversations and asking better questions and providing better compelling statements, we can really start to almost overcome these objections before they actually become um, uh, objections on the surface. So as we kind of think about building relationships, I think oftentimes we kind of overlook just how important it is early on in the conversation to really kind of position ourselves as that trusted advisor. This is where we're really trying to focus as much as possible around helping them understand the things they don't know about making the, the right decision. And so oftentimes, you know, we kind of complain about people that are buying landscaping and say that they just want the cheapest price. But it's really up to us to explain why the cheapest price may not always really serve them all that well. And so what we want to do is really kind of create that trust, create that credibility in the way that we ask questions and the way that we provide answers or statements to kind of help uh, them learn. So I think there's, you know, a few different ways to do this. Uh, we're going to always look at First off, we want to be able to listen to the customer, understand exactly what their needs are. So before we ever start selling, we want to make sure that we're super clear on what they need and what they're really looking for specific as it relates to their property. Now, oftentimes they're telling us what they want, but they're not telling us what their problems are. And so I think it's really important as you're asking questions to understand why they want what it, what they're telling you that they want, because sometimes people just don't know exactly what the best solution is. So they're actually asking for something that maybe they don't really want or need. Maybe there's something that they actually need a lot more to solve their actual problem. And that, that's up to us to do that as uh, professional landscapers. So um, oftentimes, down to it and we really start to hear objections as we're sort of discussing things like budget or maybe talking about specific products we start to kind of like understand what the objection is maybe they tell us they don't want to spend as much as they were hoping could be many different things but ultimately i think what we're trying to do here is just help them understand exactly um what their their objection is and so what i like to do here is actually say their objection back to them. Maybe they're talking about price, but maybe the way that I kind of bring the, the objection back around is I could ask them whether or not they're actually concerned with the price or concerned with what they're getting in exchange for um, the money. And I think sometimes that in itself, handling that very tactfully and politely, that in itself really creates dialogue that is otherwise missing. You know, when people just tell us, they don't want to spend that much. It's up to us to try to find out how much they do want to spend. Of course, that's there's an art in uncovering budget, but we really need to help them understand what the objection is. Is it actually budget or is it perceived value? Or, you know, ultimately, when people have a problem that they want to solve, they do kind of assign a value on that problem, depending on um, how big the problem is to them. And, you know, if it's a commercial customer, that problem is usually fairly easy to calculate a return on investment, for example, a snow plowing contract. But if it's somebody's backyard and they're hoping to install a beautiful um, swimming pool and, and landscaping and plants and lights and irrigation, 
you know, that's going to have a very specific value to them based on the value of their house, based on their income, and based on their access to capital to, to actually go ahead with the project. And so we have to be very good at really understanding what the objection is and then tying it to the problem that they have to solve and the value that we have to offer. Um, super important to get that right. We have to make sure that when we restate the problem that we start to actually put some value to it. And again, if I'm talking about snow plowing, let's say to a commercial contract, when they start to tell me that my price is significantly more than the competitors, it's important that I start to explain where the value or where the price is, is coming from in terms of like, why are we more money? And then stating exactly what the value is in a way where we can kind of assess whether it's worth them spending more money to avoid business interruption or an accident, a slip and fall claim, um, maybe a, a shipment from leaving their loading docks. It could be many different things. And so ultimately what we're really trying to do is make sure that we address the objection and kind of get their mind directly on the value. Um, anytime that you're not clear when you hear any kind of objection, and even if you're not really quite ready to overcome it, like you're not sure how to establish value, I always think that it's wise just to ask for some clarification, create a little bit more dialogue. Because one thing I really notice a lot in my year selling landscape, the more clarification that I would ask for when I was handling objections, the more likely they were to almost resolve it themselves. Like as I would poke a little bit, oftentimes they would sort of answer their own um, objection, which I think is, there's an art to that. And you have to be very careful without, you know, uh, coming across as being uh, negative or, um, you know, thinking that you're the smartest person in the room. You have to really kind of ask questions in a thoughtful way where that person really believes that you're trying to better understand them. But ultimately, I think the more dialogue, the more likely you are to kind of mutually overcome these objections. A uh, few other things that I really notice is you know, when it comes to closing and really trying to use the objection as a closing method, I think it's really great to actually kind of prompt them as you get a little further into a conversation with a few probing questions to kind of make sure that you're sure what the last and final objection is. Once you've got that, then what we wanna do is we wanna just close with a real question that really um, helps clarify that that is the last objection, but then we wanna really lay on a really strong power statement that overcomes that objection in a confident way and really puts that one to rest before asking for the close. This is really important. In fact, I've always found that if I can actually leave one sort of lingering objection, maybe not their most uh, um, concerning objection earlier in the conversation, but one that I can tell is sort of burning and it's sort of a central point. Um, I often wanna kind of leave that one uh, and come back to it at the end. It, it's a little one that's easier to overcome, but one that's also gonna kind of create some momentum. Price is a big one here. You know, ultimately, I think most of us know that one of the major objections is always going to be price. In some cases, it's going to be service levels or capability or the size of your company or your past experience doing a, a similar type of work. But I think at the end of the day, price really does come into uh, existence most commonly at the end of the conversation. And so I always try to say, if you're really going to focus on closing with a question, make sure that you're really confident in talking about price as you kind of get to the end of the conversation. And so we want to have done all the legwork earlier in the Q&A. We want to have already established a lot of value. We want, to, we want to have explained what makes us different, how we're going to do the work differently. We want to sell all of our value drivers for the specific type of work that we're selling. We want to kind of do enough Q&A that we get the big objections out of the way. And then we just want to kind of gracefully go into the close. And I think 
oftentimes salespeople almost like find objections frustrating. And I hear this a lot when I'm teaching uh, the mastermind workshops. People get like almost annoyed by the fact that their customers are going to select a contractor based on price. And for me, I think it's actually like probably the biggest opportunity. I always kind of uh, appreciated people who are price sensitive um, in the final stages of a big snow contract, for example, because it was a, an amazing opportunity for me to start to really value engineer the proposal and work with them to take their budget and actually pull it into a comfortable position and make sure that we can provide, you know, accurate, detailed scope that we can clearly afford to do profitably. But I think coming on the end of a sale, when you can really just overcome that final price to value conversation and make sure that the customer feels like they're gonna get problem solved, they're gonna get fair value and it's gonna be an affordable price and there's a lot of trust. I think if we just kind of gracefully get into our closing conversation, everything really starts to come together nicely. Um, a couple of things that I really, really uh, recommend people do as often as possible when they're selling. And you might be an owner operator. In that case, you don't have a whole team of salespeople to practice with. Pick a friend, you know, another peer in the industry, maybe a, um, a a friend or a family member could help out a little bit. Personally, I really like doing this with other people who sell. And there's probably other owner operators that you know that would benefit from doing this with you. The reason I like doing it um, more commonly with people who are really, really like ingrained in the industry is because they, you know, act like the customer better than somebody from outside the industry. And I think, you know, when you're when you are doing role play sales training, what is happening is you're learning just as much when you're the customer as when you're the salesperson, when you're playing those various roles. And I think, you know, two uh, people that sell for a living, that understand landscaping are going to ask better customer questions, better salesperson questions, um, play the roles in, in a little bit more uh, meaningful way. And as I said, I think you learn just as much in either seat. And so it's important to kind of pick a good partner. Um, so, oh, sorry, I hit the, the button. So a couple a couple that I really like to re recommend if you know, you're making some notes, objection to price is key, right? We This is the most common one that we're ever gonna face. I just talked about it quite a bit. But when it comes to really dealing with objection over price, you have to have your methods to overcome those objections for each you know, major service line that you're selling. So residential landscape maintenance, objection to your uh, weekly package or your monthly package, um, how are you going to handle that one? And so you're going to role play that and role play it and role play it and role play it. So that every time you go meet a homeowner, you've got the perfect uh, method to handle every common objection. And you kind of know which one to leave to the end to pull into the close. And so the more that you role play and document your motion, I think the, the more likely it is just to be there waiting for you when you get started on site. So we want residential landscape maintenance. We want um, hardscape like pavers. Maybe you're uh, big into the paver business. What are, what are your objections, uh, ex objection handling questions gonna be there? Um, snow management for each uh, ICP. Is it gonna, you're gonna have very different objections in residential or HOAs than you might have with a um, hospital or an automotive parts plant or a transportation um, uh, hub for a train station or a bus station, for example. So what we want to do is think about what the objections are going to be or what they typically are when you're out selling. And we want to make sure that we're role playing each. And so a couple that I like, you know, obviously objection to price. Again, we want to study this and practice this based on each persona and each segment of the market. Objection to timing. This is a big one that I think oftentimes people don't uh, role play often enough. 
the timing of um, an install project is an is an incredible uh, thing to try to overcome in many cases, particularly in the spring. You know, everybody wants their pool built in the spring so that they're swimming for the July long weekend. And we all know that that's impossible. We can't build every pool at the same time and hope to succeed. So we have to get really good at finding ways to actually use schedule and timing as a, as a tool to actually drive more uh, uh, shorter um, sales cycles, as opposed to letting this become a reason for them to go in another direction. And so the way that you handle these objections, the sales process that you use, how you describe the planning phase, like in, in the case of the backyard pool, if you said, hey, listen, it takes us about eight weeks to get your drawings complete, your permits in for approval, your property all surveyed and staked out before we can start the project. And so we're definitely going to be in that sort of eight to 12 week range. We don't typically book dates until we've booked a design contract. If you'd like to book a design contract, we'll give you the state your price, we'll give you the date, the next available date, and that's eight to 12 weeks out, you're going to tell them that date. Now, what you've done is you've kind of bought yourself 12 weeks, they, they wrote the check, they've made the commitment on the design, they're more than likely going to book the spot. And I think what you've done is kind of use the timeline to your favor. But I think what happens a lot of times is um, salespeople walk through the door and they don't really have a defined way of doing business. They don't have a clear call to action to book a date today. And I think in the in the process, um, two, three weeks goes by and timelines uh, back up. And the next thing you know, you've kind of lost a lot of those bookings. And so I think knowing what your next available date is, having a real talk track, understanding like how to use um, objections relating to timing is actually a way to close versus a way to delay or lose a contract, I think is a, a pretty important tool for more or less any installation work. This one really becomes um, a big topic. Typically with landscape maintenance or snow, this isn't a big, big topic, obviously. Um, unless it's like timing of service or the date of schedule. There's always some things like that, but this one's largely for install. Um, so going back to price objections, a few things to keep in mind when you, when you get into actually developing some of these um, talk tracks for your different customers. Just remember that the core thing that we're trying to do here is always articulate the value over the price or the cost of the work. Because I think most people, they just naturally think that um, every landscaper does the same work. It's, a, it's not right. We all know this, but we have to educate them on the fact that the installation methods and the practices and the um, details around how we do things are very different, right? We can get a thousand square foot patio for $10,000, or we can get one for $40,000, but they're not the same thing. And people know this instinctively, but uh, for some reason, when it comes to project work like this, they just don't really think of it in terms of a brand and, um, or sorry, like they would for a brand. And so a comparison in your own mind is cars, right? People buy cars every day of the week. And sometimes they buy a Volkswagen and sometimes they buy a Mercedes or a Porsche. Um, both cars are gonna get them to the same place. They're only allowed to drive them the same speed. They probably both have leather seats, a stereo, all the little bells and whistles. You know, let's face it, cars have gotten pretty similar these days in terms of features and functionality. Yet people are willing to pay two or three times the price for a luxury brand as they are for a, a you know, daily driver. Now, there's a reason for that. There's better materials. There's better technology. There's better design. Um, there's better workmanship. There's uh, perceived value. There is actual value when you go to sell that car again. And so at the end of the day, automotive manufacturers do a great job at marketing uh, to get that message out so that their salespeople 
really don't need to do that. Like, I don't think many people walk into a Porsche dealer and ask the salesperson uh, why it costs more than a Volkswagen because the marketing did the work for them. And so in our case, when we start to do a lot of work in role play, what we have to do is really figure out a way to create that messaging and explain what makes us the Mercedes and everybody else the Volkswagen. Now, the good news is not many of your competitors are good at doing this. So if you're not great at it right now, if you just get good at it, you'll probably be a whole lot better than everybody else. And so that's why we're here, obviously. What you need to be able to do is explain what makes your work different. Now, just like the cars, your designs are better, your processes are better, your service offerings are better in the case of um, maintenance and snow. Um, the scope is, is deeper. There's more uh, detail. Um, there's more time being spent um, doing the work. There's um, more expensive materials being used. Uh, we've got better technology to support the, the, the programming. Like for example, in the snow business, you're gonna sell the fact that you've got a customer portable and ser service uh, verification and um, very detailed uh, billing and um, risk prevention tools so that you can avoid uh, slip and fall claims. All these details that the others may not have in their service offering or in their proposals in the case of an install. So we wanna be very, very capable of explaining all of this using a Q&A model, which is the power questions and power statements before you start to actually get to the point where you're asking for the close, which is the close may not be the final close. The close may be just getting the right to give a proposal. It may be selling a design or it may be, yeah, the final contract. In any case, we wanna make sure that we build lots of uh, trust before we kind of start to get to these um, objections and, and uh, trying to overcome them together. But what we wanna do is make sure that as we build out the questions that we're kind of being like almost preemptive, that our questions are kind of designed to get them to tell us their objections as quickly as possible. Now, this may sound kind of crazy, but at the end of the day, many of our customers um, feel like they're afraid to tell you that they have a fixed budget. Some of them feel um, that, you know, they don't want to necessarily tell you what the budget is because maybe they don't need to spend so much. Others, they don't want to tell you what the budget is because they, you know, want to find a way to grind you down to the cheapest possible price after you give them one. And so there's lots of different beliefs out there and we can't control those. But what we can do is just really make sure that our sales process and our questions really sort of state the value and help them overcome the objections before they even get a chance to say them. So some big tools here, and I think most landscapers are not doing a great job uh, at creating customer testimonials, at creating really good case studies that are kind of built into their conversations, but then supported by the actual um, portfolio that you're selling with or the leave behind that you may be um, working through as you're kind of walking through your, your uh, service offering in your initial meetings. So what we wanna do is, is you know, focus on creating the right type of questions, the right type of information and the right supporting documents to build the trust right off the start before you really get into heavy q and I think it's just important that you position yourself before you kind of get really, really deep into the sale. Then um, going back to Gittimer's methods from the sales Bible, I've been talking about uh, Gittimer's sales Bible quite a bit the last few weeks. And those of you that have started reading it are probably really seeing some similarities because we definitely wanted to kind of create a series here around a, uh, a, a book that would be very relative that you could use in your own company's day to day. Um, Clearly, we've built LMN to support a lot of this work, but I really have noticed this past year that um, many, many contractors are starting to find it harder and harder to close business. And that's really why we sort of put together this intensive around selling. 
Now, when you get to this closing technique, the Gittimer has, I think, some really unique ways of looking at things in that sales Bible book. What I really like is this, this concept of transition from objection to the close. And I noticed that this worked really well in selling landscaping. I talked about it a little bit earlier. This is where we kind of leave an objection or two toward the end of our conversation that might not be quite resolved, knowing full well that we're gonna have a really good tool to kind of drop on them as we ask for close. A, a tool being, you know, maybe it's a resource, maybe it's a case study, maybe it's some sort of explanation of return on investment. Maybe it's a testimonial from a similar customer, but we wanna be able to kind of pull that out and, and talk through that to overcome that final objection without them having to have like an uncomfortable conversation with us. So the better tools that you have in your toolbox, the better your portfolio, the better your leave behind, the more connected that is to your typical questions for that ICP, the better. And, you know, this is starting to sound like a lot of work right now, but let me tell you, it's well worth it. You definitely need a different portfolio and a different leave behind when you're selling residential install work versus weekly or monthly maintenance accounts for residential versus, you know, commercial landscape maintenance. And even within commercial, you're probably going to need a different portfolio depending on the ICP that you're focused on. So um, back to specialization, you know, you've probably heard me say this before. I think some landscapers just try to cover way too many customer profiles. And in the process, they kind of hurt themselves in the sense that they don't appear to be the expert to any of those customer profiles. And so what they end up getting is the low hanging fruit, the people who are not actually looking for the absolute best um, value, but people that are actually just looking for the best price. And so when you specialize, and I'm not saying you can't specialize in three different customer profiles. I'm just saying that when you do choose more than one, you have to make sure that you prepare sales copy. That means um, your portfolio, your leave behind, web pages, social media, um, any, any sort of digital footprint. Uh, and then, of course, you have to be able to speak to those customers and really, truly understand exactly what the problem is that they're likely to be facing so that you can kind of pull that out as early as possible. I've got uh, only a few minutes for questions today, but happy to take some questions. I kind of went through a lot of information super fast today. Objection handling, I think, is one of those skills that we could talk about for a full day with a group. It's just an incredible uh, needle mover when you get it right. I think it's hard stuff that many of us avoid. I think all too many landscapers uh, know that they should probably prepare a little bit more. They should probably build some better tools, better resources for selling. But ultimately, I think, you know, many, many times we just move a little bit too fast um, in our day-to-day -day work to kind of stop and think about what we could do better to really improve the results. And I don't think there's anything that we can do that has a higher return on investment than focusing on creating um, know-how and tools and resources to really sell the right customers, the customers that are going to be spending more money, customers that see value, that buy higher revenue per hour work, that make decisions based around quality and value rather than price. And if we really want those customers, this tool is definitely something that you need to really master, objection handling. Um, I don't see any questions. I think we're, uh, I think we're all set. Oh, how do you deal with a customer who's just looking for free services, like free design or um, consultation? Sarah, that's a good question. Um, I personally, I feel that um, if somebody really truly expects free design, that you should 
first off, explain to them, again, that's just an objection. I don't want to pay for design. You should first explain to them why you charge for design and why other people don't. That's the easiest way to start. And this, I think, is almost a gift when a customer tells me, hey, we met with three other contractors and they all designed for free. Um, immediately, my answer had, has always been the same. I've always come back with this. I started in design build, um, always did very detailed projects, charged for design right from my first day in business. What I always came back with was the same. I always ask them, did you get a chance to look at some of their drawings? And oftentimes the answer is no. Um, then I would always ask, hey, did you get a chance to look at the portfolio of their past work? And usually they'll say, well, yeah, they've got pictures on their website. And my next question is, how does that work look in comparison with our work? Does it look as, as um, well designed? And I'm pretty confident about the quality of my design, so I'm happy to say that. Um, when they'd come back and say, well, yeah, they have nice work. Uh, your work looks really nice, but their work is nice too. I, I would expect it, right? I'm not the only good landscaper on earth. What I would then move to, sometimes they'd say, yeah, you're right. Their work's not that good. So I kind of had a, had a bit of momentum, but there's many times where they say, well, actually, yeah, their website looks great. Their work looks pretty good. I would immediately then pivot to my next major driver, which is the experience. You know, when we do a design, the reason we're designing is to make sure that we actually create everything um, for you. I need to know how big your patio should be based on how you're going to use it. I want to talk about all of the different use cases that you're going to have. And then, of course, I really need to understand exactly what is going to appeal to you visually. I don't know your style. I, and this all takes time. So what doesn't happen when you've got free design is you don't get mood boards and you don't get inspiration meetings and you don't get um, a specific meeting to go through uh, two or three design options. And so what happens is you kind of just move to a proposal and you skip all of the collaborative time. Now, we believe that the collaborative time is super valuable. And by taking the time to do that, we can put together a much better set of drawings. So we know that we're going to actually build something that really solves for everything that you're thinking of and hopefully more as we start to collaborate. But there's one more big driver that I want to get to. And the third on the design is um, just imagine what happens with a free design if it's not well thought out and if all the details haven't been discussed. And so I like to show our designs before I ask to charge for them because I like to show how much detail goes into the design, um, how much uh, we rely on construction details. They're standardized details, but they're built into the package so that they understand how much base they're going to get and how we're going to use um, drainage and how we're going to use slope and grade and uh, how we're going to fasten materials and how we're going to detail uh, carpentry work and stonework and the way things should look. And often when I start showing them the detail pages, the light bulb kind of goes on. That's when they sort of realize that there's a big difference between free and this, because what ends up happening is we're really going to see a lot different um, construction methods being used. So there's a lot of value, but worse, um, if there's no details, every time that homeowner comes home, they've got questions about why something looks a certain way or not. And ultimately, to be honest, this ends up being a problem for you and them. They feel awkward during the project because they don't know what they're going to get ahead of time because the design wasn't detailed enough. But on the, on the other side, you're kind of ending up doing a lot of rework for free. And so I like to kind of really talk through the value of actually taking the time to build a proper design and explain to them that that can't be done for free. Everybody in the world trades their time for money. We can't possibly put that much effort into something and not get paid for it without hiding that expense 
somewhere else. And so I just kind of warn them that if they get free design, there's not much value. They're probably setting themselves up for a less than ideal outcome with the project and a frustrating experience getting it done. And if they're lucky, everything will go perfect, but that's pretty unlikely with no plan. It's kind of like driving from Boston to California without a roadmap or, well, let's face it, Google. Um, we just can't build something this complex with no drawings. Uh, next, uh, maximize revenue per man hour. Watch the smaller projects very closely. A good comment from Anton. Uh, Sarah, oh, thanks. Uh, glad, uh, glad that answered the question. Ray, uh, we've been hired to pitch a new design for a commercial building. The design's ready to go. The building owners would rather do a Zoom call to just see the design without me in the room. I'd prefer to meet in person. I uh, appreciate they're a group of physicians, super busy. Yeah, Zoom, I mean, I'm trying to actually promote to a lot of people to use Zoom for uh, early screening meetings, you know, rather than driving all over the city. You should be able to do a Zoom meeting meet the people, figure out what they want, show them your portfolio, explain your process, and then book an in-person meeting just to save yourself the hassle of meeting with tire kickers. Um, but in the case of something like this, a commercial building, if you've done a detailed design or a concept drawing, I would really sort of recommend that you ask them to meet in person because it's hard to review big drawings on a little screen. And that would be my ultimate reason for them. But the truth is, I just think you build a lot more rapport when you're in person. I think you get a lot more um, mileage out of the Q&A when you're sitting there and when you can kind of, you know, point at things and describe things and pencil things out on the drawings. And I think just explaining that to them and educating them a little bit more. You know, oftentimes people want to do business the way they think it should be done. But once we start to educate them and explain the benefits of an in-person meeting, um, being flexible, saying, hey, we could do it that way, but we don't usually do that. And here's why. I think that, you know, often helps um, the most. But I would try wherever possible to present uh, your designs in person uh, for sure. Uh, I think that was it. Uh, agreed. Um, yeah, wish you luck. Yeah, good luck with that one. I think, um, yeah, just try to uh, work your magic and let them know why uh, why you want to meet in person. Just keep adding value and uh, being that trusted advisor. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you joining again this week. And uh, we're going to move on next week. Uh, again, I've been using the sales Bible as a tool. Please um, uh, feel free to um, shoot me some messages, questions as you go, but it's a fantastic book. Um, next week, we're going to talk about closing deals like a boss. So we're going to talk about some more closing techniques, kind of taking this final step uh, uh, through to close. I think there's, you know, different ways of presenting pricing. There's different tools that we can use to ask for the close and get the close. We're going to kind of work through those next week. So I'll see you then. And uh, keep in mind, there's lots of training coming up. If you're in the snow business, we've got some two-day in-class training for snow companies to really kind of get the most out of LMN this year. Uh, those We've got five sessions. They're kind of spread out. Hopefully there's one in a city near you or we've kind of selected uh, cities where they're easy to get to. And this fall, we will be doing the business uh, transformation program. This is going to be a, a different um, workshop than last year. So if you did attend last year, this is very different. Um, certainly some similar topics, very, very different content, a lot more in depth that kind of builds upon what we talked about last year. We're going to um, make sure that you leave with some really uh, good frameworks and we're going to kind of build the processes as we go through. So we're going to cover a little less ground, go a little deeper on some very specific topics. So definitely uh, love to see you out at one of these uh, Dallas, Chicago, Detroit, Boston. Um, we'll be uh, on that roadshow, I guess, uh, through November and early December. So hope to see you out at one of those. And of course, you can always follow along on LinkedIn and Instagram. 
Thanks again and uh, have a great week.